Hello, my scholars, my literary loves, and welcome to InterEd. Today, we're going to be discussing some historical context for America's favorite creeper. That's right, Edgar Allan Poe. We're going to situate his life in the larger context of American and global history so we can understand some of the undercurrents that are in his stories. So we'll start with an overview of the dates in his life. Edgar Allan Poe was born in the year 1809 in the city of Boston, Massachusetts, right? So he's born way up there in the northern puritanical corner, northeastern corner of the U.S., but pretty early on, his father abandons the family, and then shortly thereafter, his mother dies of tuberculosis, and the Allen family takes his in, takes him in and moves him down to their home state. And we know that all of this was accomplished by the year 1812, because that's when he was baptized down in the city of Richmond, Virginia, with the Allen family. So that's the beginning of Poe. He really lives the majority of his life in Virginia. And then he dies. That is a whole other, whole other issue that you can get into. Why he dies and how he dies and what he dies of is a very interesting conversation that you may or may not have covered with a different fun interactive activity. So he dies in 1849. He's only 40 years old. And by the time he dies, he's been living in Baltimore, Maryland for a good portion of his life, which is right next door to Virginia. So that Maryland, Virginia area. That's our hero, if you will. That's certainly our author of the day. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to move forward and talk a little bit about what exactly would have been going on in Edgar Allan Poe's lifetime that might have an impact on his writing that might be creeping in there, even if he's not thinking of it consciously, it's certainly going on in the landscape of his world and might be something that we want to think about when we're analyzing his work. So what we're going to do is we're going to do this in three separate parts. You're going to have an opportunity to pause. There is an interactive notebook that goes with this video. So you can pause here now is a good time to pause and fill in the first page of your interactive notebook if you've got that ready. And then we'll go over exactly what the structure of this video is going to cover and I will give you cues as to good times to stop and fill in your notebooks. So first, part one, we're going to cover general U.S. history, right? Just basic things going on in the context of American history in the 19th century and a little bit before, right? And then we're going to cover how that fits into the history of global colonization, right? Because America is not alone in what it's doing in this continent. There's a lot of other forces at play that are impacting our history. And finally, we're going to turn our attention to that hidden shadow that's at the center of American history, but we don't talk a lot about, which is the history of slavery, which is really, really core to the founding and the construction of this country. And yet somehow we don't talk about it as if it's central. So we're going to pay attention to the way these three threads intertwine. So when you're ready, if you've got your first few slides of your notebook filled out, in your notebook, there's an overview slide that corresponds here, and it just gives you a glimpse at all the things that we're going to be putting in context. You're not responsible for knowing all of that just yet. It's just a preview. So it, when you're ready, let's begin part one, general U.S. history for the lifetime of Edgar Allan Poe and a little bit before because there's some pretty important things happening just before Edgar Allan Poe is born. The first thing that we want to pay attention to, of course, is that the American Revolutionary War is not very long before we meet Edgar Allan Poe. He's only born about 20 years after the New Republic, like really, really soon. And in those early days of the American Republic, we've got a couple of other things going on. So we have we fight the Revolutionary War. That's going on 1776 to 1783. That's against the British. 
Um, and then we ratify the Constitution of the United States. There are, the first 11 states are listed down here at the bottom of the slide. That's Delaware, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Georgia, South Carolina, New Hampshire, Virginia, and New York. And pretty shortly thereafter, we get North Carolina and Rhode Island, and finally Vermont in 1791. So our 13 original colonies plus one. Vermont's kind of a new formation. Then on top of that, we get the ratification of the Bill of Rights. So the Constitution is what founds our country. And the first 10 amendments of, of the Constitution is the Bill of Rights. And that's what establishes things like the freedom of speech and the freedom of religion and the right to bear arms is a very popular one. All of that is in the Bill of Rights. So that's early on, literally two decades before we see Edgar Allan Poe, pretty new. Then as we move forward, one of the key things that's happening as we're building up to Edgar Allan Poe's lifetime is the U.S. is adding states to its repertoire, if you will. Um, so territories are occupied, but they don't get added as states until they hit a certain threshold of settlers that arrive in the territory. They have carved it out and made townships out of it. And the unfortunate consequence of this is that they've also driven the indigenous population out so that the white settlers outnumber the indigenous population. So that's a key component of statehood. That's another video. I'd be happy to talk more about that um, in another video. Then we have the Louisiana Purchase. So right before Edgar Allan Poe is born, the U.S. actually doubles its size doubles it by purchasing all of this territory that had been occupied by France and France can no longer handle it and they don't want to be in charge of controlling it or dealing with the indigenous populations here. And so with a lot of complex negotiations that is ceded to the U.S. in the Louisiana Purchase and Louisiana itself becomes a state in 1812. Right. So there's our Louisiana Purchase. Um, but then next we have the addition of a lot of other states. Right. We see Indiana, Mississippi, Illinois, Alabama, Maine, Missouri, all of these just boom, 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 one after another. And there's a little bit of a break. So this is this is during Poe's childhood. There's a little bit of a break in his early adulthood before we see a few more. We see Arkansas, Michigan, and then in 1845, we get both Florida and Texas added to the Union. And that is right before uh, the end of Poe's life in 1849. So let's have a look at that. Just this is the map of how many states there were in the U.S., by the time that Poe dies. So Texas and this territory in the square is the last one that is added. So if you're curious about these maps, I have given you the addresses for each one of these maps and images in the credits that are at the end of this video and at the end of your interactive notebook. So if you wanna follow up on these, there are live links to those a little farther down. Uh, so 28 states by the time that Poe dies and then a lot of Western territory in here that is frontier, but also let's not forget that on this part is New Spain, right? And we're gonna come back around to that in part three of this video, but just get in your mind what portion of the US exists, what parts are states, and what parts are still unsettled territory for white settler colonists, these are of course places that indigenous people already live, right? So we have roughly a little less than half of what we now know as the continental United States is currently settled, occupied, and has ratified statehood by the time that Edgar Allan Poe dies in 1849. So that's our general U.S. history landscape. Part two is the history of global colonization. So if you're following along in your digital notebook, now is a really good time to stop, do the slide, do the interactive slide on the US history timeline. That's one slide only. It's got a bunch of these key components that we just talked about with all of the different dates and you just put them together on your timeline. When you're ready, come on back, hit play, and we'll go into the history of global colonization. So a reminder of all the dates 
for what's happening in the U.S. These are, of course, taking place in a larger context of European global colonialism. So that's what this segment is going to be about, is reminding us what's going on in the wider world as the U.S. is expanding and adding states, right? So first of all, the War of 1812 is usually considered a part of U.S. history, and I won't deny that, but I do want to contextualize it because this is really just the U.S. front of what was a much, much larger global colonial war that was happening with Napoleon, right? These are referred to as the Napoleonic Wars. So let's take a look at this. I like this map. This is the sixth coalition of the Napoleonic Wars. I like this map because it tells us just how global the Napoleonic Wars are. And what you're actually looking at are all of the places where European powers are fighting each other. Yes, you have an alliance color code here, so you can see Napoleon and his alliance. They're in green. They're not quite as successful in this map as they are in earlier ones. Um, and then everything that's covered in blue, these are territories that the anti-Napoleon coalition has managed to either conquer or control. So you'll look at that, that's gonna include Spain, that's gonna include Portugal, that's gonna include Britain. The US is not really a part of this coalition. As you can see, it's grayed out on this map, but what they are doing is fighting with Britain over some of their frontiers and territories during this war that is going on all over the globe. And a key and important part of this uh, that's going to impact later history is actually Britain's Britain's fights with France in India, right? And you can see that here, over here on this part of the map. Right now, that doesn't really seem central to U.S. history, but it will become later because this is where Britain is going to start to establish its foothold and create an empire that's going to affect the entire world in the 19th century. So by the end of the 19th century that Poe is living in, Britain will cover a huge portion of the globe. If you're interested in this, I have an additional Ed Puzzle that you can look at just to see the history of global conquest in a map format. So I'll make that available to you in the links to this, to this Ed Puzzle and video. So here we are, we have our global Napoleonic Wars going on in 1812. They're mostly winding down by 1818. And this is where we get the Treaty of 1818, which establishes our northern border, right? So you'll recall from your knowledge of US history that Canada still belongs to Britain. It's not really even, it's not an independent country at all. Um, so what is today Canada belongs to Britain. And one of the areas that's still under contest with Britain is this region up here. And what this treaty establishes is this little line right here. It's called the 49th parallel. It's a uh, latitude measurement that tells, tells us exactly how far away from the equator we are. This 49th parallel becomes the established border between the UK and the US all the way up until Oregon country. And this, the UK and the US agree to joint occupy at this point in time because there are not enough white settlers in the region for either one to say that they control it yet. So that's the Treaty of 1818 with Britain. Notice who's not consulted in that treaty, the people who actually live on these lands. We get another very similar treaty in 1819. That's the Transcontinental Treaty. It's also called the adams onis Treaty. Um, Onis, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong. But this treaty is important for two reasons. It cedes Florida to the United States and it establishes a boundary between the US and New Spain. So let's have a closer look at this. So here, Florida, as you can see, was a part of New Spain. And again, that is going to come back to us in part three of this lecture. The other key component here is this boundary with New Spain is established between the US and New Spain. Some of this territory has been contested. And so this boundary is really an important marker of the peace between global colonial powers. The US is not a global colonial, po colonial power yet, but they certainly have those ambitions. Spain is a global colonial power, but it is waning, which is how we get to the next major development, the Treaty of Cordoba, which is the treaty that secures Mexican independence after the collapse of the Spanish Empire. 
So there's a lot of factors that go into the collapse of the Spanish Empire, so I won't get into it a ton, but I will comment that the Napoleonic Wars are a part of how that empire came to a point where it was no longer sustainable, right? So now on the U.S.'s southwestern border, instead of New, New Spain, we have the new country of Mexico. And that's what is going on in the global context. So to fit these two pieces together, we'll just remind ourselves of the U.S. context here in white, right? And then we'll fit these global events into that timeline. Now, I would love to do the same for slavery, but it's going to get a little bit crowded. So we can only maintain that for a little bit. So if you are following along in your digital notebook, now is a good time to pause and put your history of global colonialism components into the right place in your digital notebook. Pause this video here and come on back. This is the third and final part of this historical context mini lecture. I will warn you that this one is a bit longer than the previous two. So make sure that you've got time and attention to do this part. If you wanna take a break here and come back to this later or maybe tomorrow, that would be a good strategy because the, the last part of this video is gonna be about as long as the first, the first three, the introduction, part one and part two. Okay, so buckle up when you're ready, let's move forward. So, a reminder of the things we've already covered, right? The Revolutionary War, the Constitution is ratified. Here I listed out all of these states that we discussed earlier ratifying the Constitution. And I put the dates that they ratified that Constitution. And don't forget our Bill of Rights, Louisiana Purchase, War of 1812, the Treaty of 1818, the Transcontinental Treaty, and the Treaty of Cordoba. Those are all still on this slide. Now, what we're gonna talk about is the fact that all of these, all of these states, when they were colonies, were originally slave colonies. And that's because in 1619, slaves started to be imported into the Americas for labor. And there's a great historical project on this online. It's from the New York Times. There is some scholarly controversy around it, but altogether there's a huge, huge amount of resources that you can explore. It's called the 1619 Project. So if you're interested in learning about the early history of slavery in the US, I would encourage you to follow up on that. Lots of resources and some research credits at the end of this video and the end of your notebook that'll tell you where to learn more. So from 1619, there is slavery on this continent. That's a fact. As we move forward, <clears throat> there are certain colonies that begin to outlaw slavery before the ratification of the Constitution. So even in colonies, there are uh, communities that have decided not to include slavery. Abolitionist communities, some of those are for reason for anti-racist reasons, as Ibram Kendi would call it, and some of them are for equally racist reasons like they don't want to live near black folks, right? So not all abolitionists are um, <clears throat> the good guys necessarily, right? They have different reasons. It's a very complicated issue. I would encourage you to read more about it. But here we have in white, this color has changed and the date that they outlawed slavery appears. So all of these colonies that outlaw slavery now appear in white. That's Vermont, Pennsylvania, Connecticut, New Hampshire, and Rhode Island. As we move forward, we look through these same slides um, with these same components, we can start to see how that changes over time. So we add New Jersey and Massachusetts and New Hampshire, New York, to those original ratifiers of the Constitution who also determined that they're going to outlaw slavery. And as we move forward, uh, <clears throat> we get a few more. So remember all of these states as they are added. So watch here, watch down here to see as these change color, right? And notice that of the original signers, several of them stay pink and their date doesn't change until 1865. And that is because they do not outlaw slavery until they fight the Civil War. 
So I want to draw your attention to Maine first over here. Maine gets a 1783 date because it was originally a part of Massachusetts. So it effectively outlawed slavery when Massachusetts did early on. Um, slightly different circumstances, but it doesn't become a state until much, much later because it splits off from Massachusetts. So just pay attention. Maine has a very early date and that's why it's a little bit surprising. And then we had Ohio right before it achieved statehood. So 1802, Ohio becomes a state in 1803. It outlaws slavery. The rest of our states don't actually outlaw slavery until they officially achieve statehood. Indiana outlawed slavery in 1816. So we have 1818, that's Illinois. And we also have Michigan over here in 1837. The rest of all of these states maintain slavery to the point of civil war. You'll notice that all of their dates have just changed to 1865. So they're all still pink. They keep slavery all the way up through the civil war. So that's what this timeline looks like. I want you to take a moment, look it over, get it in your head. How many states are in white because they have outlawed slavery and how many states are still pink because they maintain slavery up to and through the American Civil War. This timeline is going to change on the next slide. So I want you to give yourself an opportunity to absorb this information. So to keep our timeline clean, I've cleared everything away so that we can talk about the depth of history that goes on in slavery, but not just the fact that Africans were brought to this continent and enslaved and forced to do labor against their will, but that throughout that period, there's also a history of resistance. So the next portion of this video is going to talk about that resistance to slavery, and that's going to conclude our understanding of the historical context for Edgar Allan Poe and what's happening during his lifetime. So buckle up, slave rebellions. We're gonna start by rewinding way, way back to Bacon's Rebellion. And one of the reasons we're gonna do that is because it's very significant in that it codified the racial difference between a white indentured servant and a black slave. So an indentured servant is somebody whose servitude would eventually end, whereas a black slave would not. And this is a consequence of Bacon's Rebellion. So let's jump into it just a little bit. So Nathaniel Bacon is actually a white frontiersman. He's fairly well off. He's maybe not the wealthiest, but he is not a poor white indentured servant kind of person in this context, right? He is out here on the frontier of Virginia, and he wants help subduing the indigenous population, which basically means that the frontiers people were pushing farther and farther into indigenous territory and the indigenous folks were resisting. And Nathaniel Bacon wanted help fighting against them so that they could take over the indigenous people's land. The governor of Virginia, he's got his own problems. He's got his own concerns. He does not want to send his resources to the frontier. He has to deal with what he's got down in Jamestown, which I did not mark on this particular slide. So Jamestown, if, if you remember your early American history, it's that first Virginia colony and it's a tobacco plantation, right? And this is where our governor Berkeley is hanging out. So Bacon, he's not too happy about this. So what he does is he gets together a coalition of poor white folks, indentured servants and enslaved blacks. And he pulls them together in a rebellion to fight basically his cause, not necessarily for their cause, uh, but his cause. And instead of turning those folks towards the indigenous population that he wants to fight, he actually turns them toward Governor Berkeley in Jamestown. And, and so he uses their mutual discontent with both in the indigenous population and the wealthy white ruling class to stage a rebellion that very nearly overthrows the colonial government in Virginia, like very, very nearly. Um, one of the reasons that this doesn't succeed is because of the freak accident that Nathaniel Bacon just dies of dysentery. So Nathaniel Bacon dies of diarrhea 
and his rebellion just kind of dissipates, which gives the governor an opportunity to pull his people back together, quash the rest of the rebellion and reestablish power. But then the planters are like, oh, oh, that was close. We in trouble. We in danger. So they establish this Virginia slave codes right? Nathaniel Bacon's rebellion leads directly to the first legislative action in the Americas, not only to codify slavery, but explicit racial hierarchy. So this is going to affect free Blacks as well as enslaved Blacks. So the Virginia House of Burgesses enacts a series of laws prohibiting the movement and rights of Black folks, both enslaved and free, and granting whites to... Uh, whites, that's probably appropriate, granting rights to poor whites that were denied to blacks, like specifically deciding to give rights that indentured white servants didn't yet have, or at least not codified in law. So we're going to give a few breadcrumbs to the white folks over here, and we're not going to give those breadcrumbs to the enslaved blacks or even the free blacks. And thus we can create racial tension that will prevent these two groups from ever banding together again and coming so close to overthrowing the existing government, right? That's literally the thought behind this. So what, some of the things that poor whites are granted that are denied to blacks, including free blacks, are property rights, an end of their term of servitude if they are in servitude, and the right to carry and own weapons. That's a big one. So even free blacks are not allowed to carry weapons, but those Second Amendment folks, free, poor whites, they are allowed to carry weapons. And that tension is going to be at the center of American politics for basically ever. Still there, I would argue. This codification, it also allows for the pursuit and capture of suspected runaway slaves. Now ask yourself, how do you suspect that a person is a runaway slave? They're black. Literally, they are a black person moving about without the supervision of a white person. A suspected runaway slave. So racial profiling begins here. And not surprising, this is also the origins of local law enforcement. So these slave patrols are the antecedent to law enforcement institutions that ultimately become first militias and then police and sheriff's departments later. They grow one out of the other. So f slave patrols are the earliest form of policing that happens in the colonial Americas. And one of the things that they do is they employ these poor whites who might still be landless, but they they need a form of income and they employ them to hunt down and retrieve black folks that are suspected of being runaway slaves. Now, after the slave codes, of course we get resistance. Now, I'm not saying that there was nothing between 1705 and 1800, but I'm going to fast forward us all the way to 1800 so that we can get a little bit closer to Poe's lifetime and what was happening as Poe was growing up. So what's in the air around slavery and resistance as Edgar Allan Poe is forming his opinion of the world. We have lots of conspiracies and, and rebellions and uprisings, but a lot of them are thwarted. And part of, part of the reason for that is because the slave owners, the landed and the wealthy class, the plantation uh, owners, they realize what a precarious situation they're in if they manage, if they, if the enslaved people who vastly outnumber them actually manage to have a successful uprising, right? There's a lot at stake here and there's a big, big reason to keep that population subdued. So Gabriel's conspiracy is a, a famous one early on. And one of the things we want to pay attention to here is the the magnitude of retaliation that comes with subduing these rebellions. So this is in Richmond, Virginia, a place we want to make a mental note of because that is a place where Poe grew up in Richmond, Virginia. 
Gabriel and his two brothers are putting together a conspiracy. But of course, in the era before social media, before cell phones, before the internet, the way you get the word out is by mouth and you have to be able to plan on a date because you need enough time for everybody to get together. So in the process of planning and coordinating and waiting for that date, they get ratted out. Their conspiracy is thwarted. Gabriel, his two brothers and 23, 23 other slaves are hanged. Then a little bit after that is the Igbo landing. So if you want food for your creepy Gothic thoughts, the Igbo landing is, it is the thing for you. So this happens in Georgia, a shipload of West Africans, largely Igbo people. They took control of their slave ship. So they broke their restraints and they drowned their captors. And while they're in this struggle of overthrowing their captors, the ship runs aground. So the ship runs aground. You now have this boatload of 75 Igbo people who are stranded in Dunbar Creek, Georgia, with no way to get anywhere else. And Gullah folklore, Gullah are the people who are in the southern U.S. descended from West Africa, like the Igbo but they create their own culture. Culture. So Gullah folklore to this day maintains that these West Africans looked around, assessed their situation, and decided they would rather risk their lives than going to the living death of slavery in America. And what they did is they turned around and they walked over the water back home to Africa. Now, of course, the gory part of this is that we could conclude that this is a mass suicide that they've chosen rather than slavery. Uh, but there's a lot more to it in the mythology, which is that they walked over the water and they sung hymns and allowed the water spirits to guide them home. And the question is how you interpret that. Do you interpret home as Africa and they made it by walking over the water? Or do you interpret home as the afterlife and they therefore walked into the water and drowned. So food for your Gothic thought, but also imagery that stays in Southern imagination and the black culture of the Southern United States forever. Because to this day, people will tell you that the area of Dunbar Creek is haunted. That's one. And second, <laughs> Even in popular culture, you'll see references to the Igbo landing. What you see on this page is actually a screenshot from Beyonce's visual, visual album, Lemonade, in which a train of women walk out into the water in her video, Love Drought. So what's happening in resistance culture continues to have an undercurrent in American culture throughout the 19th century and even into our own moment. So we want to make sure we pay attention to the ways that th this history impacts our culture. So we've got the Igbo landing. And then after that, we also have slavery or the importing of new slaves that becomes illegal. Now, this is actually written into the Constitution and it was ratified in 1788. But one of the compromises between the abolitionists and the slaveholders was that they did not want to outlaw the importation of slaves yet. But we could all agree to outlaw it in 20 years. So the abolitionists, they're thinking, great, that's a step towards outlawing slavery altogether. And by the time we get to 1808, when the importation of new slaves actually becomes illegal, the actual consequences of that is that Virginia becomes a slave raising state that exports slaves to other states. And that is literally done through coerced reproduction which is a long and clinical way of saying rape. And what this means is that black women, black enslaved women were forcibly impregnated and forced to carry those babies to term, not because they were children and not because of the sanctity of life, but because they were commodities and their the fruit of their loins, their labor literally produced more property. <laughs> 
right? And the slave owner who owned that woman could impregnate her himself. He could have someone else impregnate her. Uh, slaves were bred for particular characteristics, just like animals. And uh, once she gave birth to that, the slave owner had the option of keeping that slave to raise it to the point of becoming a laborer and therefore getting free labor that way. Or the slave owner could sell that child at any point uh, because it is property. It is a commodity. So just because importing new slaves was made illegal, that did not stop slavery. Instead, it empowered Virginia, which became the primary source of obtaining new slaves because they were breeding slaves. Even Thomas Jefferson, who you'll remember, especially if you know your Hamilton, is a Virginian. He comments that the most valuable slave that he can own is a childbearing woman, not a heavy laborer, not somebody who can do a lot of work, but somebody who can make more slaves. This is the end of your slavery slide one in your digital notebook. So if you're following along, now is a good time to pause and put these components in order on your notebook and then come on back when you want to hit slavery slide two. I just split them into two pieces because it was a lot of information to handle. So we'll organize these and then we'll pause. We'll move on to the next slide and we'll organize those. So when you're ready, come on back. So this is slavery slide two in your notebook. It's the last interactive slide in your notebook. Um, and it is the last portion of this history lecture. One of the things that we wanna pay attention to now is the consequences of these uprisings. We wanna understand the culture that's happening, that's building in the American South during the lifetime of Ed Edgar Allan Poe, because you'll notice in between the importation of slaves becoming illegal and this next component on our timeline, the German Coast Uprising, Edgar Allan Poe is born. So in 1810, we have our German Coast Uprising in Louisiana. And this is significant because it is the largest slave uprising in the United States, and some 95 slaves ended up killed or executed. So a huge uprising, huger backlash. As we move forward, we have the Boxley Rebellion. This one is significant because it's led by a white abolitionist, George Boxley, but even though he's active in Fredericksburg and Richmond, Virginia, an area we're familiar with, this uprising ends up thwarted for the same reason as Gabriel's conspiracy. And that's gonna happen more than once. We also have a thwarted uprising from Denmark VC in 1822, that's in South Carolina, thwarted in the same way, but the thing to note here is that people don't stop trying to resist. They don't stop. No matter how many of these rebellions get put down, there continues to be resistance. So we're going to look next at a very significant one, and that's Nat Turner's rebellion in 1831. And this is in Southampton County, Virginia, which is not too far from Richmond. Um, it's actually in the Tidewater region, very close to where Jamestown was originally established. In Nat Turner's Rebellion, you have 70 or more enslaved and free blacks going house to house, freeing slaves and killing whites. This, of course, gets turned into a major, major travesty because of the killing of innocent whites. So we have a lot of emotions in this newspaper article that you see this woodcut from uh, for the poor innocent whites. But I will point out that Nat Turner's Rebellion did spare poor whites because they deemed poor whites to be hardly better off than themselves. So they're killing only slave owning whites and they did kill about 60 people before the militia came in surrounded them and quashed the rebellion now here's the thing that's really significant about nat turner's rebellion not only is nat turner himself punished uh deeply his death is really gruesome if you want to look that up on your own i will yeah you got that's on your own time um but after the rebellion is suppressed not only do you have reinforcements, so two detachments come from ships that are moored in the Norfolk Naval Shipyard, um, they also execute 56 blacks who are involved. Some folks, some black folks were killed during the suppression. They execute 56 more, and then they kill another 100 or so who were not involved in the rebellion at all. 
just, you know, for good measure. So Nat Turner's Rebellion ends really badly, and that's 1831. So I want you to think about those dates. Poe is 22 or so, which is literally halfway through his life, a little bit more. He's already over the hill. And this is a big part of what is happening, and it is in his neighborhood. It is right around the corner. Well, okay, it's just a little down, <laughs> just a little southeast of where he is living at this point in time because he's actually going to the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. So he is not far from this at all. And let me tell you, it was major in Virginia culture at this time. So Nat Turner's Rebellion is something that we want to remember for historical context and Poe's world as he's experiencing it. But it is not the last rebellion that we're going to talk about because I want to take a moment to talk about the Second Seminole War. Yes, there is more than one Seminole War. The First Seminole War has a lot of the same components, but the second one becomes especially significant because of the African population that is involved here. Now, a couple of things to note. We have our newspaper coverage of the Second Seminole War. Massacre of the Whites by the Indians and Blacks in Florida. This should look familiar to you, right? Horrid Massacre in Virginia was the newspaper coverage of Nat Turner's Rebellion. But also, hang on, check out these two spots of these newspaper printings. Look familiar? They are literally the same woodcut. So one of the things we want to be aware of is the way that this this discourse of slave rebellion is being received in white culture, right? So we're treating these two events, the Dade Massacre in South Florida and Nat Turner's Rebellion, as though they are the same because, oh, poor innocent white folks are dying. They're so the same that we're going to even use the exact same illustration for both of them. But we want to make sure we rewind and understand the circumstances in South Florida are a bit different from Virginia. Virginia, slave state all the way from the beginning, right? Indigenous people have been driven out of there for centuries at this point, most of them. There are some who who remain and, and retain claims to land in that region. But for the most part, Indigenous people have been pushed out of Virginia long before this. Not the same thing in Florida. So let's rewind, remind ourselves right? The Transcontinental Treaty gives Florida to the U.S. just 1819, right? That's really recent. So prior to 1819, that is New Spain, Florida, right? So remember, this is not a part of the United States until 1819. And it's not even really transferred to U.S. power until the 1820s. So just because a treaty is signed in 1819 doesn't mean suddenly, whoop, U.S. control. That's not how that works. But remind yourself also that the Transcontinental Treaty was a product of these larger global Napoleonic Wars, right? So New Spain is collapsing partly under the pressure of being involved in this global colonial warfare. But here's the other key component of this. The issue of slavery and colonialism are very much entwined, right? all throughout the U.S., but especially here we see it really prominently in the Seminole Wars, right? The plantation economy needs both slavery and colonialism. And to understand this, I'm going to turn to indigenous scholar and historian Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz has written this great book called An Indigenous People's History of the United States. So even before cotton becomes king in the South and Eli Whitney's cotton gin provides that access, plantations were cash crop plantations, right? And in the colonies and later the United States, this cash crop is largely but not exclusively tobacco. In the Caribbean, that'll be sugarcane. So different different kind of thing. 
So Dunbar Ortiz writes, she says, the plantation economy required vast swaths of land for cash crops, even before cotton was king, leaving in its wake destroyed indigenous national territories and Anglo settlers who would fight and die driving out indigenous communities and yet remain landless themselves, moving on to the next frontier to try again, right? So key component here, plantation economy requires both land and labor. So in order for this to become this, right, those little original colonies, in order for them to expand and become these much larger U.S. states with a much bigger Western frontier, with all of this plantation slavery, something has to be done about this. And that those are the indigenous people who are living on this land. This is their traditional territory. And as you can see, there's a lot of them. A lot. So early colonial history, we have to acknowledge that many indigenous Americans died from disease after they first came into contact with European traders. So before Europeans even begin settling this continent, they are trading, and when they do that, they bring all their smallpox with them. So there's that fun stuff. Um, smallpox and other diseases, lots of other diseases, including plague, including like the Black Plague of the Middle Ages. Um, other indigenous people fought long, bloody wars to attempt to retain their lands, but they end up in what is really just a long retreat away from the infringing frontiersmen and the rangers who are fighting to settle that territory. Right. So we already have a lot of indigenous death and indigenous flight from this region. But we also have indigenous folks who are trying to escape this warfare and death by fleeing south to New Spain because New Spain doesn't have a strong grip on this part of their new territory in the Americas. So Dunbar Ortiz tells us that the Seminole nation is born of resistance and it includes vestiges of these dozens of indigenous communities as well as Seminole towns as rep that serve as refuge. So you have all of these indigenous people from the Appalachian area and the Piedmont, which is downhill from the mountains, they're fleeing south to New Spain to escape the Americans, right? And as they do this, they take up with the Seminoles and they form new communities that are kind of hybrid refugee societies in what are today Florida swamps. I mean, they were still swamps then. Today they're in Florida. Some of these indigenous folks were deemed civilized and therefore the approach to those folks was less extermination and more assimilation. They were encouraged to become like the white settlers and settler values like property rights and even slavery were instilled in these folks. So assimilation was one tactic to try and get rid of indigenous resistance. Extermination was another. But if we layer on top of this colonial history, our history of slavery, we meanwhile have self-emancipating blacks fleeing south to what is now Florida. And sometimes they go west, but a lot of times they go south. It's closer to Florida than it is to Arkansas, right? So the Seminole Nation, that same quote, you'll notice, as well as escaped Africans, right? We have the vestiges of dozens of indigenous communities plus self-emancipated blacks who settle in these seminal towns as refugees essentially. And this gives rise to an actual Afro-Indigenous population in Florida. In other parts of the world like the Caribbean and Brazil, these folks go by the term Maroons. In Florida, they just become a part of the Seminole Nation. In the end, it doesn't help because you'll remember that the U.S. acquired Florida anyway, right? And the Louisiana Purchase to the West for anybody who fled westward, which ultimately resulted in the start of the Seminole Wars in Florida and, of course, the tragic forced relocation of even the five civilized tribes, and this was known as the Trail of Tears. So no amount of resistance seemed to allow people to escape 
the westward and southward continental colonial expansion of the United States, which is how we get here to the Seminole Wars, which is both an indigenous resistance and a slave uprising in Florida, right? During Poe's lifetime. This is what's going on. This is all in the consciousness of the people who are living in the early 19th century America, especially when you think about living in the South, in Virginia and its neighbor, Maryland. So I'd like to take this moment to point you back to your notebook and your final slide. Perhaps there's an additional follow-up question asking you to think a little bit about this history and how it impacts the world that you're dealing with when you think about Edgar Allan Poe or just the early 19th century in America. So take that time, go ahead and, and complete that work. And we're going to wrap up by giving some credit where credit is due. So I developed this tool. This is a lecture that I put together and recorded and made into an Ed puzzle. It has a companion notebook, which hopefully you know already because you're following along and you're completing it. But I want to make sure that I give credit to the critical race theory and the black feminist thinkers who informed this approach. That's Kimberly Crenshaw. And of course, we've got some image credits for all those maps and images and some research credits here at the end. You can find references for Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, Reginald Horseman informed this, Ibram Kendi, Charles Mills, and Linda Watts are all referenced and or quoted and or cited in this lecture. Thanks so much for spending this time with me. This has been Historical Context on Edgar Allan Poe by InterEd.